Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this week we're going to be talking about books that we wish we could live in. And there are six of us here from the Monroe County Library System to share those books and where we wish we could just be sometimes. But before we get into that, in case you want to get your hands on any of these titles that we talk about, uh, these are the ways that you can do it. If you'd like a physical copy, you can request hardcover, paperback, CD, audio, large print using our online catalog. All branches of the Monroe County Library System are now open for curbside service. So you can get in there and request those titles. You are also welcome to call your branches and say, hey, I watched Literary Libations. They talked about a title and I'd like to request that. You can do that as well. If you'd like any of these items digitally, there are three options. If the item is listed as available on Overdrive, you would go to the Overdrive slash, it's called Libby if you're going through your app store. And Overdrive offers eBooks and downloadable audiobooks. You might also see Hoopla, and again, just go to your app store and look for Hoopla, or go to the website that's listed here on your screen. And Hoopla offers eBooks, downloadable audiobooks, and also movies, music, graphic novels. And then we also have RB Digital, which offers downloadable audiobooks and also magazines, week-long passes to Acorn TV, or a week-long pass to The Great Courses. And the great thing about Hoopla and RB Digital is if you see an item on there, you can download it immediately. There's never a waiting list on those particular platforms. So that's how to get your hands on the titles that we're going to be talking about. And now I'm going to go ahead and introduce who's with us. I'm Jennifer Grineski, and I am the community librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And our introductory question this week, since we're talking about books we want to live in, is if you could choose any place in the world to live, where would you choose? And my place is if there were a house right there, that's where I would be. And this is a picture of Prince Edward Island. And I had a chance, and if you've been watching these, you know that I love Anna Green Gables, but I also had the chance probably about 20 years ago now, before marriage and kids, a group of friends, we all rented a house on Prince Edward Island. And it was literally like right there on the bluffs. Like you woke up every mo morning and you could see the ocean. And, and then it's just a little drive into town where, you know, there's civilization because I'm, I'm not a wilderness person at all. So I need some civilization, but I also love that feeling of being alone and in nature. And, the, and I love the ocean. I just, I feel like I would be a better person if I could see the ocean every day. <laughs> like it would just make me a calmer, more centered, kinder person just having the ocean there. So that's where I would go if I could choose anywhere. Also with us today is Barbara Kruger, who is the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Monroe County Library System. And where would you live if you could choose anywhere, Barbara? Not surprising to all of you, I overthought this question. <laughs> <laughs> My first impulse was to think of someplace exotic and tropical. Um, I love traveling, I love Jamaica and the Dominican, but to live someplace, and I'm not just saying this because it's 4th of July uh, weekend coming up, I wouldn't pick any place besides America. I think we're very blessed to live in this country. And uh, with, and I've been to the 48 contiguous states. I've not been yet to Alaska or Hawaii. Um, and of them, I think I would pick Pennsylvania. I love the mountains. I have family there. I think it's just, I feel very rooted and grounded when I'm, when I'm there. And it's beautiful in all four seasons. Nice. And with us, we also have Ashley Lyford. And Ashley is the community librarian at Petersburg. And if you could live anywhere, Ashley, where would it be? Um, I was going to say Disney World, but I'm actually going to change and say Disneyland, well, California, Disneyland, because it's um, the temperature is a little more controlled there. Um, it's not hot all the time like it is in Florida, but I still need to be close to Mickey Mouse's magic. <laughs> Nice. I also thought about Disney. I didn't think of Disney World. I thought, or Disneyland. I thought of Disney World, and I was like, no, it's too hot. 
I yeah. couldn't do that year round. It's good to it visit. I couldn't live there. But California is like 70, so. Yeah, Southern California. Especially if yeah. you're by the water. Yeah. Yeah. And also with us, we have Jen McCarty, who is a reference librarian at Ellis. And where would you live if you could live anywhere? I forgot that we had this question, so I did not overthink it. I've been thinking about it while you guys have been talking. <laughs> so I, I think I'm going to go with uh, one of the states that um, Barbara hasn't visited, and I'm going to say Hawaii. Oh, nice. Because um, I hope uh, Disney was a thought as well for me. I'm also a Disney fan, but once again, no thank you. Um, Florida, I love Disney, but Florida, um, it's a swamp. Yeah, and it, it feels like a swamp. It's not palatable, except unless you're in the castle. Um, so Hawaii <laughs> is beautiful because it's another place that's, even though it's tropical and it's lush, it's pretty temperate. Like their temperatures are about 80s. The water is warm. It's beautiful. And if we're assuming that we can live anywhere, we're assuming that we can afford it. So I would, <laughs> yeah. Be, right? Yeah. I would be really down to live in Hawaii, you know, especially maybe one of the smaller islands where you know no big city feel just like sort of chill like amenities but i got my beach i can go snorkeling fresh seafood yeah i mean i don't like seafood the culture so gonna spam and rice i guess I think but it's <laughs> gonna be moving with you, <laughs> you know, i know my parents just went there and they came back and i was like stop telling me about it i just i, I was lucky enough to go there for my honeymoon it's been nearly 15 years but it was gorgeous and i would love to go back so nice okay. And we also have with us Kristen Brown, a reference librarian at Bedford. And apart from moving with Jen to Hawaii, <laughs> where would you want to live, Kristen? So mine's actually the opposite kind of of Hawaii. So I would move to either like Alaska or Iceland. Um, and I would go down like the homesteading route. So I am obsessed with all the homesteading shows and my dream would just be to like wake up with the mountains, but also go out and like tend to my animals and my farm. And that's my job. That would be amazing. I have a feeling that I'm underestimating it substantially. <laughs> I feel like it would be very hard and I do like the cold, but I'm not sure if I like it that cold, but I just feel like that would be such an immense freedom, you know, like, it would just be crazy to do that. So that's always been one of my my dreams to go out and ask Alaska and have a homestead. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask this because my husband is currently obsessed with a couple of homesteading shows. Oh. Is one of them that you watch is at Lumna Acres? No, what's that? It's <laughs> it's a family that that is literally they're homesteading. I mean, they're not super far away from civilization. Mm -hmm. I think they're out in the northeast somewhere, but they're they're, like they're all their own chickens and goats and pigs and they've got they built their own greenhouse and yeah, yeah see Jen's shaking her head and to me I'm like <laughs> I'm not doing that but the funny That's part amazing. is I shared this because Mike was telling me he was watching this week's episode and he's like they got a chicken to pluck her he's like you just drop the chicken in and it like spins yep. around I've seen so that. here's me that shows that I grew up in Flint and I'm a city girl I went wouldn't that hurt the chickens <laughs> <laughs> like to be spun around like that, like that would hurt them. And he looked and he goes, "Hun, they're butchered before right. they put them in there." I was like, "Oh, because here's me picturing these poor chickens." I was like, "That seems like a horrible thing to do." So, needless to say, I'm not homesteading anywhere. But if you need a show to watch, Lumna Acres on YouTube. They're very. Right. I'm fat. Like clearly, I'm learning things. <laughs> So, all right, so now that we've gone off on that sidetrack, <laughs> and we also have with us Marcia Langendorfer, a reference librarian at Bedford. And where would you live, Marcia? Well, I'm a lot along the lines of Kristen, I think, too. And I was thinking this over and I decided that I would pick right here. I love Michigan. I love the seasons. I specifically love my home. I did. I was raised on a farm. We did pluck chickens. <laughs> um, so we grew. I grew up on a farm, which I think everyone should experience. I think it's awesome. So we. My grandpa owned 40 acres. My parents built on that, and then we built on that. I love looking out at the compound and seeing my family in my backyard. Stay at home orders work just fine for me. So I picked here. I picked here. I really. I'm pretty rooted. I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon. So I so picked here. Sense. I love that. That was your answer. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's here. I thought about spinning my camera and showing everyone where I live because you guys all have fun backgrounds. And I'm like, here's my dream. But yeah, it's beautiful though. It's here. <laughs> that is excellent. Thank you everybody for introducing yourselves. And now we're going to get into talking about the books that we wish that we could live in. And we're going to start with Marsha, who just introduced herself, and she's going to share her books first. Yay. Well, along those same lines, I feel like I kind of went with a pioneer theme. I, I long for that and yearn for it all the time. I miss, I miss farming. Um, anytime I think of anything, I'm, I'm all for, I'm all for the good old days. You know, less technology, more outdoorsy. But, um, though I picked the Little House in the Prairie series for those same reasons. Um, I feel like I loved those as a child. I loved the TV adaptation of there, and every time I would watch the Little House series, I felt like. I just wanted to live there. I just wanted to live there. I, I want to go back to those days where you go out in the field and pick your pick your beans for dinner and stuff like that. So I really yeah. I really miss I really miss farming. Um, so I love the Little House series. And then for a grown up version, I went ahead and tied in the um, Janet Oakey series of the Love Comes Softly. And um, I specifically love the first one, Love Come, Love Comes Softly. But they're all they're all nice. They're very homesteady and kind of feel good movies. And I like Katherine Heigl, so I really liked the movie adaptation of this as well. So I felt like it's, um, again, it's along those same lines. I felt like, oh, you know, they lived in a time where, you know, the preacher only came through twice a year and they had to wait till spring to go home. And just the thought of a wagon train, like, I feel like I'm underestimating it as well. But there is a part of me that just feels like, man, that would, that's the way to live. So I, I went very pioneery. And then for one final one, um, I decided for Janet Ivanovich, I picked this more for fun. I don't necessarily want to live where they're at. I just want to be Stephanie Plum. I want to be, um, I want to be. Wait, Marsha, you don't want to live in New Jersey. No, I don't want New <laughs> Jersey, but I want to be, I want to be Stephanie Plum. I think she's so funny and um, grandma is hilarious. I mean, if you've never read the Janet Ivanovich series of one for the money, two for the dough, they're very fun. There's a mystery, a little murder mob tie-in, but in a fun, fun way. So I decided I want to live in Pioneer Times, but be Stephanie Plum. And then ironically, <laughs> yeah. ironically, the movie version is also uh, portrayed by Katherine Heigl. So maybe I just want to be Katherine Heigl. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, so those were my tie-ins today. I wanted to be Stephanie Plum, but then live in Pioneer Times. But be on the prairie. Yeah. Exactly. So now <laughs> I'm Plum picturing, the like, now I'm matching those. The next big TV show, because Stephanie Plum is like a skip tracer, isn't she? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so now I'm picturing like Mom and Pa Ingalls getting chased yeah. by a skip tracer. Like, listen, Pa, uh, you know this law you broke. You're out of there. Yeah. When I when I saw Marsha's selection of Little House on the Prairie, I thought, man, why didn't I think of that? My daughter is actually going to college in Minnesota in a tiny little town called New Alm. And when they need to go to the big city for a mall or a decent restaurant, they go to Mankato, just like the Eagles did. <laughs> but she doesn't take a wagon. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it doesn't take, you know, like three days to get there or anything. No. No. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, I did read all the Little House books, mm -hmm. but I guess I read them with the perspective of, yeah, I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, why I took that. Oof. Jennifer. Because the, the scene that I most remember reading the books is there's a scene where they're doing their um, hog butchering and Ma takes the pig's bladder and blows it up and it's a balloon for Laura and Mary to play with. Yep. I still remember that. Like I can picture the illustration in the book and everything. Pain with That's the pig's my childhood. bladder. I used to take chicken feet to church and pull the tendons and paint their nails. I mean, Sam and Elizabeth, <laughs> but I'm telling you, you're, you're speaking my childhood. That's what I did. Uh, so you read about it. I lived it. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. It's like, no. Yeah, like, I'm not doing that, but I'm glad somebody <laughs> else can that wants to. That's the important thing. All right. Kristen. What are your books that you want to live in? Okay, so this was kind of a tricky one because uh, there's so many great books that, I mean, that's why we read books so that we can escape, you know, from reality. Um, but I went with a Nora Roberts series that I've probably read at least five times. I keep going back and forth and I don't even read them in order anymore. I just pick which cousin I want to read about. So I did the cousin the Odor Cousins trilogy, uh, which the first one's called Dark Witch. Um, 
And so if you're really big into fantasy and fiction and witches and it's a Nora Roberts, so it's, I mean, it's got some romance in it. If you've read her before, she gets a little, you know, a little schmutty. Um, um, it's based on the lead dark witch. Her name is Scorcha and she has this rivalry with this um, Kavan. And he's uh, like a dark wizard and he wants to pretty much make her his bride. And so he keeps trying to go after her and she's happily married. Her husband's always away. She's got three kids and she's she's basically like um, like a green witch, which is like a term that they use nowadays. It's, it's just like she's a, a natural. Uh, she doesn't like natural medicinal um, practices, but she also is a legit witch. Um, and so she ends up cursing uh, Kavan and then it passes through her children and this gets taken down through generations and for some reason Kavan keeps coming back like he just doesn't die and you you start with Scorcha and talks about her three kids and then you're introduced to the three cousins and um, there's Ina, Brana, and Connor and each of them each book is surrounded by their experiences and how they play in with this fight against Kavan. And uh, it's just a really good quick storyline. There's a lot of like family ties and like obviously it's heavily on family. I mostly want to live there just because they live in Ireland. They talk about living in a cabin in the woods. Um, I think that the the green witch practice is very interesting. I think it's um, I have this really intense connection with nature um, and just like gardening and, and growing and learning about natural resources. Um, and so I really relate to it in that. And uh, so that's pretty much it just because I mean, the basic tie is I like fantasy that ties in with magic in some way. And then also that it's, you know, an Irish based book and historically it kind of connects with the you know the wiccan uh celtic paganism practices that like is semi interesting to me um so uh, apparently though when i went to go look at reviews people were not happy with that series so if you normally read nora roberts i feel like it it's it's a trilogy. She always writes trilogies. It is a little different than some of her other stuff, but I didn't think it was too far fetched from Nora Roberts usual stuff. Um, so it's definitely a great book. Check it out. And my other one was I tagged this on last minute, but when um, Marsha was talking about Little House on the Prairie, I was like, man, I should have picked Little Women. I feel like that's the epitome of uh, like my childhood. That's I mean, we watched the movie all the time in my family. It's just something that me and my sister and my mom watch all the time. And growing up, we read this book a lot. Um, and so if you're not familiar with the storyline, it's about the four uh, March sisters and there's Joe, Beth, Amy and Meg. And they all represent to me like uh, different personalities in, in young women. You know, Joe is very uh, um, she's very bold and steadfast and and uh, Beth is Beth is timid and kind and soft and Amy, Amy's rambunctious um, and then Meg is like the sensible one. But I feel like it's it's timeless in the themes that it carries, um, especially the theme of, you know, like self image versus self worth. And I think Marmy has a lot to play in that because she really tries to push the concept of being true to yourself and, and building a strong esteem over over having things and doing things. Um, the big reason I chose this book is because of Joe, uh, because of her personality, because of who she is. I would like to be Joe in that book. You know, she reaches this point in her life where um, she doesn't, she's trying to help her sister figure out her feelings about a good friend of the family, Lori. And so she ends up going to New York City um, and it really changes her life. She ends up meeting this professor and, and their relationship evolves, but she does a lot of self-exploration in a time that I think is is pivotal in history. Um, and I also think it's super interesting that the author, uh, Louisa May Alcott, wrote so much of that about her own life. 
Um, like she actually grew up in the Orchard House. She was a, a transcendentalist. And during that time period, that was kind of a, a new age way of thinking. Um, so I just think it's a fascinating storyline. And just to be in that time period and to be a woman and to be kind of, you know, like um, forward thinking like that, you know, to go to New York by yourself during that time without being married was like a big thing. Uh, so I just, that's my other choice. Nice, thank you. Now I do have to ask, what movie version did you grow up watching? So we grew up with like the, the uh, Winona Judd one. Okay. But we also watched the Katherine Hepburn one too. Okay. So like we watched both, but we usually watch the 90s one. Oh, one thing that I would not want to have happen is Beth. Can we just like write out the Beth part? Like I want to <laughs> live in this book, but I don't want like the Beth part. So like that's my only stipulation. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just change that. Yeah, yeah, like we'll just, Beth gets better and she's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Just, just like when we talked about dog books, you just got to stop, you know, like a couple chapters before the end. It's just right. Yep, that's how it ended. Put it yep. away. Okay, this is what we're going to like, skip. She's gone. <laughs> All right, thank you. And Jen, what books would you like to live in? Okay, I just want to take a moment to point out because I it made me really laugh that none of us are doing. I think we can collectively all say that we wanted to pick Harry Potter. So <laughs> let's just get that out there. Harry Potter. I think none again. of us picked that because we all thought we would pick it. Probably. Exactly. Okay, so since we're not picking Harry Potter, um, the two books that I pick have similar titles, but they're very, very different books. Uh, the first is Artemis Fowl by I think it's actually pronounced Owen Colfer. I'm not positive. It's very Irish. I might be getting it wrong, but we're going to say Owen. Um, Artemis Fowl is a criminal mastermind. He's 12. He's a genius. He's kind of awful. So in this first book, um, it's the first book of eight. There's eight in the full series. Artemis is 12. He's precocious. He's um, the young, you know, he's part of this criminal mastermind family. They're super wealthy, but they've lost a lot of their money because his dad went missing and his mom has kind of went a little crazy. So Artemis is trying to figure out ways to get his money back, possibly save his mom. He's not sure where his dad is. He's got all these things working. So in researching different ways that he could possibly make his money, he discovers the people with a capital P. Um, the people are basically fairies. And there's this whole other world in this universe, in the Artemis Fowl world, um, where it's the lower elements. And it's basically fairies and trolls and gnomes and dwarves, and there's a centaur. Um, and they all live underground. And so I picked this book. I wouldn't want to live, you know, Artemis is cool. He's, wit he's rich. He's, um, he lives in Ireland, also probably beautiful. But I don't want to live in the people world. I want to live in the lower elements world. So um, in Artemis Fowl, there's two major cities, Haven City and Atlantis, which is Atlantis. And even though the, the people live underground, um, it's a very technically advanced society. And they've even though they've you know secluded themselves, they're completely hidden from the reg regular world. Um, they have this really cool communal sort of with nature like they live they live underground they live you know deep in the earth but they still have like this very um earth centric view and part of the reason they're hidden is because they don't like what us awful humans have done to our planet um <laughs> but they're very technologically advanced they have all this cool tech they have all these cool inventions they can stop time they can do all these really cool things and i would just want to hang out in the lower elements i forget about the you know earth us humans that are <laughs> terrible. Um, I want to hang out with the fairies and the dwarves. And if you haven't read these, um, like there's a lot of cool little plays on the main character other than Artemis is Holly Short. And she is a captain in LEP Recon, which if you read it, it's Leprechaun. Tricky, Mr. Colfer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this this book takes all those sort of like fairy stories and, and you know makes them more modern, but also makes it like, oh, they're not just little fairies. Like, you know, he he, he wants to 
try to do something with the people to possibly save his family and it goes into the leprechaun oh if you catch a leprechaun you get a pot of gold and it kind of is like that but it's more like if you're good enough to catch one of us we'll give you a ransom um but i i love this i love this world i love these books there is a new movie on disney plus um my family and i watched it my kids not having read the books loved it they're a little obsessed <laughs> it's really different than the books yeah so I watch the movie. I didn't really like the movie, but the book sounds the book's always better. It, <laughs> it was OK. Um, I'm glad that I didn't. I think like we started reading the book, the first book now with my boys who are um, six and eight. And so far they haven't given me too much. That's so different. That's so different because it's very different, but it's still good. If you have Disney Plus, you might want to check it out. But so that's Artemis Fowl. Um, my other book also called Artemis very very different so um artemis by andy weir he's the author who wrote the martian um artemis takes place on the moon so it's my background um artemis is actually the name of the first u.s colony on the moon and i want to get my book in front of me um let's see if we can kind of see it so that's basically like a little oh no you can't see it darn never mind um <laughs> basically the colony is set up there's four like giant bubbles. So each space has its own sort of use. So there's, hold on, I wanna go back in here so I can get the names right. Um, each little space is named after a famous astronaut. So you have the Aldrin bubble after Buzz Aldrin, the Shepard bubble after Alan Shepard, the Bean bubble, and I can't remember his first name, and the Conrad bubble. And they all surround the Armstrong, Armstrong bubble. So there's actually, the Armstrong is smaller and then the other four bubbles are around it. Um, and this colony is really cool because it's typically what you'd expect. There's people that live there year round. It's also heavily tourist, you know, touristy. Um, and I just think it'd be cool to live on the moon. <laughs> so this story follows uh, Jasmine Brashara or Jazz, who is a permanent resident of Artemis um, her dad is a welder because there is there's industry. They actually farm aluminum from the moon rocks, um, which has a double purpose of the process of um, creating the aluminum from the rocks. One of the outputs, and this is scientifically accurate, is oxygen. So they're able to create this industry where they are creating aluminum, which they can use to build on Artemis as well as ship it back to the Earth. Um, but one of the byproducts is oxygen, which they're able to feed into the bubbles for the people who live there. So Jazz um, lives here. She's kind of a small time crook. She gets the opportunity to pull a big heist. So this book is really fun um, in that basically it's like a criminal heist on the moon. <laughs> um, once again, kind of like, you know, I said earlier, why I'd want to live there, but only if I could actually afford it, you know, <laughs> most of the people who live on artemis don't have a whole lot of money it's not great hey i live on the moon but you know i eat algae because i can't everything has to be imported they don't make you know um so unless you're super super wealthy i'm going to be super wealthy in this scenario where i live <laughs> on artemis and i can eat real food and not eat algae um <laughs> but it's a really fun story there's all kinds of cool moon stuff they actually like visit the lunar landings like it's a tourist destination um you know the, the the actual spots of the space landings is you know you can take out like you know lunar buggies or whatever um, but they talk about the tourism industry and like how crazy expensive it is to go you know to the moon for a week or whatever but super fun and who doesn't want to live on the moon that sounds awesome it's a good book i just wrote down the title because i was like i need to read this it's a good book <laughs> And um, I never read The Martian, but I heard it was awesome. But, you know, like so many of us, I saw the movie. <laughs> I know. And that movie was really good. Yeah, so. I've heard. Um, I actually haven't read The Martian either. I've Most people who've read them both tend to like The Martian a little bit better than Artemis. But I still thought it was I fun. Did. So. I read them both, but I like I read The Martian first, so I felt like I already had liked Andy Weir as an author and the research he puts in because he's obsessed with space and the moon. So, like yep. she said, everything is scientifically accurate. Whoa. It made me want. It made me start researching 
um, some things that I did not know. So I felt like they were both super exciting and then also educational for me because yeah. I didn't know a lot about that stuff. And you're right. It's very, it's very cool tie-ins. So. And like um, Jazz is not, honestly, she's not the most likable character. Right. Um, but like, I feel like the setting of Artemis is such a big part of the book that even though she's kind of like, Ugh, you know, why are you making that dumb move? Like really think things through, friend. Um, <laughs> That it makes it okay and i really it's a very fun book it's a pretty quick read it's like i said it's a caper it's a caper that's on the moon so is that adult fiction then it is okay cool thank you jen and now ashley what books would you live in if you could so i found this question really difficult um not sure why but um i settled on two uh when i probably could have had like 10 um so the first one i'll talk about is called written in red it's by um ann bishop it's number one in a series um it's kind of like when i explain this you might think it's weird that i might want to live there so just bear with me um so the main character's name is meg and she it's it's um it takes place in a place similar to north america um but you know there's magic and um just a little bit of a difference but i like books that like could ha like think i mean honestly i know they can't happen but like <laughs> things on top of our world you know what i mean like i just like the idea of that so um meg is um a blood prophet which sounds weird but so when you cut her skin um she can see the future so of course the government has like taken control of all these people and you know uses monetizes them so um people can buy um, a cut to see what their future is or um, so something like that but she actually escapes and she goes to live with the others which is um, the magical side where there's lots of like shifters so there's like werewolves and vampires but like there's birds that um, are also beings they don't actually like talk how we would talk but they get their point across um, there's lots of there's lots of different kinds of others and um, so the others live in like a courtyard. They um, only live, like only others live there except for Meg. She's a, well, she's a human, but she is other too. Um, and if any humans come in, they have to be like allowed in, otherwise it's no good. Um, they, they're like their own government. So um, I just, I like the idea that like humans and other people are kind of living together and there's like a little magic. Um, and of course there's a little bit of romance cause I like that too. Um, so that's that one. There is like, there's that and that's a three part series and then there's a spin off too. Um, the other book I chose and um, is called Sea Glass by Maria Snyder. I love Maria Snyder. I, she's written, Sea Glass is like part of a second series that's part of a spin off. Um, it's a bigger thing, um, but everything she's written, I love. It's a little bit of a magical world. Um, the main character in Sea Glass, her name is Opal, and she has glass magic, which allows her to manipulate glass. Um, and like one thing she creates is glass messengers. So it allows people to um, instantly communicate. It's kind of like a phone, I would guess, but um, they live in times where there's not phones and technology and stuff like that. Um, this is more in a different kind of world. Um, there's all sorts of different magicians and uh, love stories, because apparently that's what I like. Um, but what's really cool is a few years ago, well, probably almost 10 years ago, um, Maria Snyder came to one of our branches and attended um sorry that's my dog attended our book club <laughs> <laughs> and um so we got to like hang out with her and then we had like an after thing event with her it was super fun jen was there too um apparently we argued in front of her oh i do remember we argued <laughs> there's about, a there's a love triangle yes, there is. at that time i think the first two books were out it was and the third uh, book was coming or the second book had just came out yes i think so and um, and we we were very evenly split on who she was the opal was is it opal that we had the most opal yep mm -hmm. um we were very evenly split Declan, on who she was gonna pick Declan and um someone else anyways my choice was obviously right <laughs> um, I, I, I wasn't i liked the other dude i, I know can't you his name either um 
But Maria like loved to like listen. She thought it was so fun to like listen to us share our opinions and we you know were go back. nice. We yeah, no, we were not nice. We were a very vocal group. <laughs> Um, so that was super fun, and that's probably part of the reason why I love everything she writes. Um, but if you haven't read anything by her, you really should. Awesome. Excellent. I love that. You know, this whole time I was thinking that I have read every book that everyone has talked about until you, Ashley. I've not read either of those. So and here's I, the thing. Yeah. If you worked at Dorsch 10 years ago <laughs> and um, <laughs> you uh, wanted to be one of the cool staff, you read the book. <laughs> like, every, I think every single staff person at Dorsch read the books. I literally, I think my first day. wanted to be one of the cool staff. No, seriously. <laughs> came up to me. I, I just want to go in there and say, <laughs> Are there cool library <laughs> staff? <laughs> I'm pretty Everybody sure most people cool. are like coolness, librarian. Mm -hmm. No, no. We no, were oh, super that's, cool. Oh, I, I'm that's pretty like sure my very first day, um, and I don't remember, it might have been Karen, was like, listen, Poison Study, Maria Schneider, read it if you want to fit in. <laughs> I have read Poison Study. It was study, peer so pressure. I, I have read her stuff. It was. I have not read Seek Lab. So, uh, yeah, that's yeah so that's the second series. It's okay. like um, Storm kind of Glass, Sea Glass, something else. Um, there's okay. like three series um, surrounding Poison Study. Well, okay. I want to be cool, so I wrote it down. <laughs> you should. Start with well, Poison Study. Start with Poison Ashley, Study. Ashley and I talked about this yesterday. I also wanted to write about a book with power, something magical. But then we were like, all of those books are in a very dystopian, um, not yeah. a happy, so I really wanted the powers, but not to live there. So I had right. to rethink it. So when you picked those, I thought, oh, those those were good choices. Yeah, because that's not so dystopian. Not but it's it's a good world. <laughs> I don't think I could be trusted with magic power. <laughs> <laughs> I just, like, like in thinking about trying to pick a book, I would keep going and go, nope, I'd die. <laughs> nope, I'd die. You nope, you're going to die in that one. Of... So then I was like, no, I can't pick those books. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. also just I just want to go back to like thinking of magic and living in a world with magic like Harry Potter. Does it seem like a bad idea? Like <laughs> having preteens with oh, the oh, ability yeah. to destroy things like that. And like I feel like it would be much more chaotic than it was. Listen, Even there's a free in the books. Books. and I don't yeah. want to give her magical powers. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. I have an 11 year old and I'm like, yeah. This would be terrible. Yeah, that's why they send I'm them to pretty Hogwarts. sure my six year old would have me stunned. All yes, the <laughs> all the time. Like I'd have the I'd probably have the imperious curse on me all the time. Oh, yeah. Or we'd be like going back and Hogwarts, forth with the imperious curse. No, I'm going to control you. No, I'll control you. Who has like, the stronger magic? Yeah, you got to find that elder one. That's why they send them to Hogwarts so their parents don't that's them. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, Hogwarts, that explains so Hogwarts. It's, it's the whole not. thing. Just send them away. It is, yeah. yeah. It's contained. I need a Minerva McGonagall for my Harry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> and Barbara, what books would you like to live in? I would be one of the people who would not have picked Harry Potter. Jen would not have had to fight me on that at all. <laughs> um, I picked the Regency era. If, if I were picking, I would have loved to live in this sweet spot in British history. So the Regency era is right at the end of uh, King George III, the, the Mad King, and right before Queen Victoria. And in this time, um, if, if you lived in this time, the authors who were being published at that time were Jane Austen, Mary Shelley, Sir Walter Scott, um, Byron, Keats, Wordsworth wrote during this time, and I just think that would have been amazing. Um, of course, if I were living during this time, I'd like to be part of the landed gentry or maybe La Bontan. I did not want to be a scullery maid, but... Um, <laughs> It was a very elegant and chivalrous and traditional time, and I, I just I just think it's beautiful. Um, so one of the titles I chose was The Heiress of Winterwood uh, by Sarah E. Ladder. I'm sorry, by Sarah E. Ladd. She's not a ladder, she's just a lad. Um, and the story starts off with the um, heroine, Amelia attending the deathbed of her friend Catherine, who has uh, is about to die in, in childbirth. And I promise it gets better than that. That's a, an ominous beginning. But one of the things I like about Regency romances, they all end happily ever after. 
So our, our heroine is attending her friend, um, her friend's sickbed uh, as she's just given birth. Um, the the baby's da uh, dad is a sea captain, so he's away uh, fighting Napoleon at the time. And uh, Amelia promises to take care of this baby for her friend. She's like, I will take care of your daughter. The daughter's name, the baby's name is Lucy. Um, you know, I'll love her like she's my own. I'll take very good care of her. Um, the problem is during this time, it was difficult for women to do that independently. Um, Amelia is not married and she's going to inherit Winterwood, which is a beautiful estate. She's the heiress of Winterwood, but it's conditional on her being married before her 24th birthday. So in, a, in order to support baby Lucy, she needs to get herself married so she can uh, do that. You wouldn't think this is a problem since she's currently engaged to Edward Littleton, um, except he's kind of a shady character and he does not want baby Lucy to live with them. Um, so um, Edward is in business with her, Amelia's uncle, uh, Uncle George, and uh, he's really pro this marriage because it's lucrative for him if she marries Edward. Um, she also lives with uh, her aunt Augusta and cousin Helena. So that those are her guardians because, you know, at, at 23 and a half, she's not old enough to take care of her own self just yet. Um, maybe something I would not like about the Regency era. So, you know, what she to do is she has to get married. She does not want to marry Edward. Um, she decides to make the risky move of proposing to Captain Sterling, the baby's father, also unheard of for a woman to do the proposing. And in her plan, uh, Captain Sterling will marry her so she can inherit. He'll go back to sea. She'll keep baby Lucy and all will be well. Um, the captain's not as amenable to that at the beginning. Um, and as he's trying to come to terms with his grief of losing his wife and, you know, this radical proposal he's just received, uh, the baby gets kidnapped. And you're left with the mystery of who, who is trying to manipulate the baby to get control of the heiress and the estate of Winterwood. Is it the um, proud fiance who has been dumped? Is it the greedy uncle? Is it the um, aunt who's a real stickler for propriety and, you know, has been embarrassed by this scandal? Or is it her cousin Helena who is secretly in love with Edward? So um, I will not tell you. Uh, how that works out, but um, I found it a, a great read. Um, I like that there was a little bit of mystery in there. It's a very plot driven um, book. It also has Christian themes, which I really liked. Um, as her friend is dying in the beginning, she recites the 23rd Psalm to her and you get to watch her grow in her personal faith as you go through. I would not say it's a Christian book. It's definitely a Regency romance, but I like those kind of soft and gentle themes, which I say, because the next series I want to talk about is not that. Um, so I love this. Um, and simultaneously, I also love the Grace Burroughs series I'm going to talk about next. But I have to tell you, um, I didn't realize that gentle reader was a, a term until I realized I am a gentle reader. I like soft, sweet things, a lot of innocence and a happy ending. Grace Burroughs is not that. Um, but I love the way she writes and I love it so much that I'm willing to overlook the steamier sections. So if you identify as a gentle reader, here's a tip. Um, when he looks deeply into her eyes, you should skip a couple of pages. <laughs> um, so uh, the trilogy I'm going to talk about is the Wyndham trilogy. Um, it follows three brothers, um, the heir, the soldier, and the virtuoso. Uh, so the heir is Gail Wyndham. He is the oldest uh, male legitimate living son of the uh, Duke uh, Wyndham, and he is trying to avoid the matchmaking efforts of his overbearing father and falls in love with his housekeeper, who was actually a lady in disguise. Um, and that's just fascinating to get to know them and, and their uh, lives and how they interact. The next one in the series is The Soldier. This is a story of Devlin St. Just, who is actually the oldest son, but illegitimate, a very uh, prevalent problem in the Regency era. Um, he has returned from eight years of fighting Napoleon and has come back with what we would term today as PTSD and um, is awarded an earldom, earldom, which is a, like a, a great uh, honor, but it includes a nine-year-old orphan who is currently being raised by her cousin, the town baker. And guess what? <laughs> uh, they, they fall in love and, and the soldier is their story. The virtuoso is the third and final son in this family. 
His name is Valentine and he is obviously a, a, a great pianist and he finds great comfort in solace and music. So in his life, he has lost two brothers, one to a terrible illness, one to war. He has his overbearing father, a, a depressed mother, and, and he plays as an escape. He plays the piano. Well, he develops what we would call arthritis and has to take a significant amount of time off of playing the piano and um, happens to um, fall in love with Ellen, who lives um, on sufferance at an estate he wanted a game of cards. So the virtuoso is their story. And the thing I like about well, Grace Burroughs and trilogies in general is Grace Burroughs loved these people so much. Instead of a trilogy, she made it into a seven part series. So she did all the boys, then she did the sisters, then she did the doctor who's a friend of the family. I just, <laughs> I love that you get to dig in and get to know them. I, like, I feel like they're my friends. Um, um, I love the character development. I love that you get to know the families. Um, I like that the themes are timeless. Um, so they're set in a different era, but I've read Regency romance novels that cover, well, these uh, PTSD was one of the things in there. Um, health problems, uh, relationship things are, are timeless um, and it's just interesting how they how they deal with them then and you know how we deal with them today so if you're looking for a way to escape uh, I'll tell you Regency romance is as far from my real life as it is possible to be I just <laughs> love everything about them it made me think of we've talked about this before when we hate when our stories end and yes. want them to keep going and that's what makes me think of this where she's like okay so instead of ending now you just learn about someone new so it's yep. like they don't really ever end they just keep going you know what kills me about this though is every time somebody says a book like you guys are talking about your books in my brain i'm like oh i should have talked about this book like for some reason <laughs> you talking about that made me think of tuck everlasting and i was like why didn't i talk about tuck everlasting <laughs> good thing that's there's awesome. more literary librations with librarians coming up that's right yeah with so many great themes. So thank you, Barbara, that was excellent. And now I will share mine. And the first one I'm gonna share is written by J.W. Oker. And J.W. Oker started writing with a blog called Odd Things I've Seen, which if you think about it is O-T-I-S, so it's Otis. And then he also does a podcast and he literally just travels around to where there are odd things. Sometimes it might have a ghost story related to it. Sometimes it might just be a weird event in history. Sometimes it's just um, a weird side attraction, you know, like when you used to drive down Highway 66, come see our giant pine cone, you know, so it might be weird things like that. Um, and then he started writing travelogue books. And this is the first book of his that I picked up. And he and his family, and at that time it was he and his wife and their daughter, moved to Salem, Massachusetts and lived there for a month during October, which of course is going to be high tourist season in Salem and I just thought it was fascinating. He also gives you the history of Salem and the, um, you know, talking about the witch trials and not just the witch trials here in America, but I didn't, clearly I missed history class. I don't know, but um, every time I read a book that has any history and I was like, oh, I must have missed that. But um, he talks about the witch trials over in Europe as well. So you get the history of it. And then he gives you, um, I didn't know that Parker Brothers originated in Salem. So he also talks about Salem being an industrial town. And then he talks about what it's morphed into now as historical tourism, as kind of schlocky Halloween tourism, as um, there's also like, at the time this was written, there was the foodie movement and a lot of um, really getting um, local food in. And the place that they rented was right downtown. So they were above one of the stores downtown. So he and his family could walk around and experience everything that was going on. He talked to all sorts of people in the town. And as a person that has a strange attraction to things odd and Halloween and I just thought it was fascinating. I just kind of wanted to be there 
alongside him because I wouldn't want to do the interviewing. That's not really my thing. I much prefer to just be able to sit and listen. But it it was just so interesting to focus on one town for one period of time and to learn what sort of made it tick. And the fact that it's Salem with all of this folklore and real history, it just made it really interesting. So I just kind of wanted to move in with his family and hang out with them for that month while they were living there. So that's my first one. And then my other one is Maeve Binchy. And if you haven't read Maeve Binchy, you can pretty much pick up any of her books and you just fall right into these characters in Ireland. She always sets it in Ireland and it's always characters that are struggling at some point in their life. It could be with their marriage, it could be with their friendships, it could be, it, it's usually relationship based. But the way Maeve Binchy writes is it never feels like these problems are insurmountable or that it feels like the world is a dark place. Instead, she always brings other people alongside them to live life with them as they get through whatever they're facing. Um, a Week in Winter happens to be the very last book that she wrote before she passed away. And it is set in the Irish town of Stony Bridge at a bed and breakfast. And it takes place really over one week, the very first week that this brand new bed and breakfast opens. And the bed and breakfast is set on the coast of Ireland where you can see the ocean. So that's why it would be a place I would want to live in because who wouldn't want to live on the coast of Ireland? And it talks about all the different people that come to stay there for their first week as they try and open. And there's a couple there that had entered a prize drawing hoping they would win the first place prize which was a trip to Paris and instead they got the trip to this bed and breakfast and they already live in Ireland so going to Ireland for them is not a big deal like to me I'd be like Ireland that'd be awesome but they were like super disappointed now they got to spend this week at a bed and breakfast in Ireland there's a librarian and the librarian tends to have visions and so she's sort of seen things about each of the people that are there. There's a young man who's having a hard time telling his parents that he doesn't want to study medicine. He wants to go into the arts and into music. Um, I'm trying to think who else is there. Those are the ones that really stood out to me. But there's probably a group of eight to 10 people and they're all there in the midst of their lives, whatever their struggle is. And during this week, they all somehow come together and start talking and and not that everything's solved and tied up with a ribbon but just knowing that you've been seen and heard and you know you're on the ocean at a bed and breakfast in Ireland um it, it's just a lovely book and that tends to be what Maeve Binchy wrote we're just even though people are struggling you always end with a sense of hope so I still love Maeve Binchy. I still have her paperback books that I read 20 years ago sitting on my shelves. And this is a good one. So if you just need something to, to know that you and all the other people out there are just getting through life and it's in Ireland. And I would also like to be surrounded by people with Irish accents. That would also be <laughs> lovely. Absolutely. That was part of the, uh, the trilogy. Hi, yes, I for you. <laughs> Like, if you could just walk around and all use Irish accents, that would be helpful for me. Like, you don't even have to say anything important. Just talk. Yeah, just talk. <laughs> just whatever you want to say, because I might not understand it, because, yep. you know, sometimes you got to really listen. So those are my two books of where I would want to live. And thank you to all of you for sharing the books where you would want to live. Thank, thank you to you. thank you to everybody who listened to us this week. And next week, we're going to be talking about books that we read in school and didn't hate. <laughs> so, so we're setting the bar low next week. <laughs> books that you read in school and didn't hate. So that's what we'll be talking about next week. Um, I don't know when this will get posted, but we're recording it prior to the Independence Day holiday. So I hope everybody listening had a great one or has a great one. And I think that's it for this week. Bye.